Hey guys, it's the History Nerd, back with Ask the History Nerd Anything, part 3 of this series, which uh, seems to be pretty popular, so yeah, keep the questions coming guys, thank you very much. Uh, Matt, seven s Matt, 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 I don't need to read the numbers out. That's, yeah, I haven't done that for ages. Um, have I read Mein Kampf? I've read bits of it. And, yeah. It's, it's interesting seeing into that mind. It's also incredibly interesting just how batshit crazy that mind is. And how, like, it, it's just poorly written. Now, granted, that could be a translation issue. So I don't know if it sound. I mean, it probably does, quote unquote, sound better in German. But um, yeah, I haven't I haven't read the full thing. But holy crap, he is, well, was a fairly crazy person. One of these days, I'm gonna sit down and read that book, <laughs> which is a weird thing to say. You know, you can't you don't really bring that up in everyday conversation with people. So what did you do this weekend? Oh yeah, I sat down, read my comp. It was, it was an interesting read. One day I'll get to it, though. Okay. What would the world be like if the Islamic world colonized the Americas instead of Europe? Um, from a historical perspective, thinking of a divergent period where all of the Americas would have been colonized by the Islamic world, that's possible, but uh, kind of difficult to do. Um... It, it would certainly be a much different place, obviously. I, the Western world would be... Um, not that I want to put too much emphasis in the New World and what it did for the West, but uh, the Western world would be a backwater. Like, it would be a fringe area. Um, probably pretty violent, if you think about it. If uh, Yeah, it would be it would be an interesting thing. And then the, I mean, the web, if the Americas had been colonized by the by the Islamic world, the Islamic world would be the the equivalent of the Western world. It would be, you know, that that would be the dominant power force in the world. Um, I think a plausible point where this could happen is uh, if you saw the Reconquista of the Iberian Peninsula not work. Um, so you would still see the northern European countries with uh, their colonial ventures, but instead of uh, Spain and Portugal, you would see those regions colonized by, by the Islamic world. I think that's probably the most likely way that could have gone. What a vague sentence. That's probably the most likely. Nice and vague. Um... Yeah, I think that's that that would be the the way you would see it. And then uh, you'd have the culture clash carry over to a completely different continent. And uh, there would have been prob there, I mean there definitely would have been far more wars uh between the two culture groups. I don't know if you would have even seen something like um like the reformation movement be able to take as much power over the western world if if the Muslim world had been able to, to get, you know, to keep Iberia and get the Southern Americas, I think you would, you would see a lot of the uh, outrage and, I mean, you you you'd have more of a uh, of a uh, of a way to um, keep the Muslims as as the big bad enemy and and from the Muslim perspective to keep the the Christians as the big bad enemy and I mean, the world would be a far more violent place I think but who knows for sure maybe maybe it wouldn't right but it just seems to me like if if in that case where the, where the Spanish Reconquista didn't work out um, you know there there'd be a lot more fighting going on in southwestern Europe and uh, and that fighting would carry over into the colonies and yeah it would be it would certainly be interesting I the uh, the differences in nations you could get out of that is is mind-blowing it's an interesting uh, interesting thought process and and historical divergent question I enjoy it um, 
can I recommend any good books? So, so that question was from Comrade Dan. Um, can I recommend any good books on the Red Terror and the Russian Civil War? Unfortunately, I cannot. The two courses in Russian history that I took uh, at any great length were Imperialist Russia, which ended, uh, the coursework ended on it in 1917, and then the next class I took was Stalinism, which took up Russia well after the Civil War. So it's a period I don't know much about, and I, I have no recommendations whatsoever on it. Um, but if anybody else does, you know, let it, let me know, let Comrade Dad know, and because uh, it's it's an area I really would like to know more about. Very interesting time period. Um, and, and just, just, like, just, just a really interesting period in, in Russian history, uh, doing the Imperial Russia history, uh, that was, Russia has some of the most colorful history out there, and, like, colorfully violent history. It seems like every generation or so, there's a violent well, there was a violent uh, overthrow or rebellion or something going on in Russia that's just, it's insane. Um, but yeah, that's unfortunately a period I don't know much of. And I think in, like that is, that's, that's something I should know more about. That's a very important and influential period that quite honestly is is overlooked in the West, at least. Uh, it's probably much different in, well, not even just in the West, in North America, let's face it. Uh, it's it's probably covered better in Europe, I would imagine. But, hey, I'm just guessing there. Who knows? Uh, okay, so... Uh, Mr. Breakthrough X. Uh, I think you're asking what I thought of the movie Zeitgeist? Okay, so... <laughs> Like I say, I haven't seen part three. Apparently part three brings the two parts together. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, it's, it's uh, I don't know, a conspiracy theory documentary. So part one covers the history of organized religion, uh, specifically Christianity, but organized religion in general. Part two covers um, the 9-11 attacks, and then apparently part three brings it all together. Uh, it's an interesting read, or if read, it's an interesting watch. Um, the problem I have with it is from looking at things from a historical perspective, it's very easy to, um, objectively look at, especially the early church, but the, just the church in general, uh, because it's been around for so long, so, so it's easy to take a look. Uh, at their history and and point out all of the things that they've done and and all of the social control that they've implemented etc 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 with the second part <laughs> the thing is with modern conspiracies there's a grounding in in fact that you can see and especially from a historical perspective uh, you know if when you understand your history of big nation states you understand what they do and how they function and what they require to function. Um, so, so you can see, you know, what exactly is going on with the changes in Western government over the past ten years. It's it's definitely changed. <laughs> um, but you know, conspiracy theories are always crazier than the truth. And for, for a number of reasons, I mean, you know, the truth is difficult to f to find out about, especially when it deals with um, big governments, because you know, there's stuff they do that they keep secret for whatever reason. It's just what they do. So, you know, I mean, you take a look at like the 1950s and the 60s with the big UFO scares, right? And they were little green men who were coming to to earth to visit us and, and what have you um, when it just turned out you know it was 
testing new aircraft designs. So, you know, what people saw for sure was a strange alien looking craft. It's flying in the sky that doesn't look like, you know, um, the planes that people knew and, and experienced and interacted with on a, on a semi regular basis. So it looked strange and alien and, and, you know, bizarre. And that's true, they did. If you take a look, I mean, just take a look at the, the B-2 bomber. That thing looks like a freaking flying saucer. I mean, it's not like a flying saucer saucer, but it certainly doesn't look like um, any sort of conventional aircraft that people had seen before the 1990s, right? It, it looked totally bizarre. It's a flat, flat flying wing is all it was. So, you know, with... with um, a movie like Zeitgeist and and all the extra high level conspiracies of, of things like you know corporations all getting together talking at Bilderberg and and things like this. I mean, yeah, Bilderberg happens. These people talk. That's that shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. People in power always talk to each other. Um, are you know are they sitting there planning genocides by chemtrails and stuff like that? Probably not. That's ridiculous. So, um, with a movie like Zeitgeist, uh, that's what I find difficult to watch, is that they don't, they don't look at things subjectively. They just accept every weird, crazy thing that they read. And uh, it's, it's one of the issues with the internet, is that all this information that's available to people, you know, you, you tend... You don't fact check. You read something, you agree with it, and you're like, yeah, that's it. And and because you can find whatever you want on the internet, what whatever you can think of is already there. It just continually reinforces these conspiracy theory thoughts. And while some of it's valid, a lot of it isn't. And separating what is valid from isn't, I mean, that's where it gets frustrating and difficult. And and it's why I don't like these these movies like Zeitgeist, because it's, you know, not everything you're saying is true, but you certainly present it in such a way that it is. But, you know, part one was pretty bang on, <laughs> for the most part. Um, so, yeah, that's that's that. Uh, I also, how about an LP of... Sokoto, maybe. Um, we'll see. I don't know. I don't. I don't want to promise anything with Civ because it's proving to be a slightly more frustrating series than than I had, or yeah. Well, I guess they are series that I had originally planned. <laughs> As anybody who's seen my horrible attempts with Germany, no, it's um, yeah. It's not going all that well, but maybe I can get my confidence back with France and then go off and try something crazy like that. But we'll see. And uh, you also want to know what my opinion on French intervention on Mali is. I think it's interesting the way in the past few years, um, France especially, but Europe in general, just appears to be growing out of the shadow of the U.S., which ultimately for the Western world is a good thing. Um, because for the longest time there was just, you know, there was one Western power, and that was America. And there was one Eastern power, and that was the Soviet Union. So now we're seeing many more powers growing up. And uh, just take a look at France lately. With Libya, uh, they were very, very vocal about getting involved there. Um, they've been very, very vocal about getting involved in Syria, and now they they basically went unilateral in Mali and then started asking for everyone else for help. Um, I think if you take a look socially at what's going on in France right now, it's a very tenuous position, and war is always a good distraction. And, I mean, France understands that from a historical perspective. And I assume that leaders of nations have a rather good understanding of history. I probably shouldn't assume that. But historically speaking, France, you know, understands the power that, that colonial ventures, and I use that in quotations, colonial, um, you know, France understands that. So, uh, it's interesting, I mean, from from personal perspective, ignoring history, it's interesting to see other Western nations kind of getting the balls to go out and and do their own thing internationally. Uh, it's dangerous. 
to say the least. Um, considering the way the geopolitical situation is, there's already many threats <laughs> in many different theaters. I don't know if we need to be continually opening up more and more in Africa, but you know, it's not it's not unsurprising that it was France who went into a former colony to help them. Well, to quote unquote help them to uh to put down the the revolution that's going on in there. Uh it's interesting the the talks that, you know, French ransom money went and paid for some of the stuff that's going on down there. So I mean that's always interesting, right? But um yeah, it's it's really what it is is just a sign that uh, the western the western power dynamic is changing and while the US is still the superpower uh other western powers are willing and able to follow up on their own uh international plans. Now, uh, you know, France is still asking for help, and, and the Brits and the Canadians and, and the Americans are assisting. At least I think the Americans are assisting. For sure, the UK and, and Canada are in there. I know our transport plane's there, so you know, we're helping out we're helping out our former colonial friends. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, it's it's got the potential to turn into just yet another quagmire. We'll see. It's fun to see France taking an active military role, though it's helping to uh, to discredit the opinion that the French military can't do anything. At least I hope it is, because historically speaking, they sure as hell can. Uh, yes, let's see, what else have we got on this page? Blowfly, yeah, isn't it crazy that um, <laughs> nobody wanted Victoria 2? Victoria 1 is still my favorite... Uh, paradox game it's just you know victoria 2 is obviously looks better and it's what everybody plays but i still fondly remember uh victoria 1 that was a great game and it, it shocked me that it wasn't as popular as it was but uh it's 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 nice to see victoria getting the love for sure and this this new expansion damn the the scramble for africa going to be implemented properly that's great news absolutely great news for that game the colonial system needed a massive massive overhaul and uh yeah i'm looking forward to it i'm hoping it's out by the time i get to uh and it probably will be i mean eu3 is going to be a slog in my thousand year reich so hopefully that comes out and i can i can use it with the with the massive series but we'll see if it comes out soon enough. I'll probably do another Victoria 2 video with that to show off all the features. Uh, kind of like what I did with Austria and my first video with Civ, just to show off Gods and Kings. So we'll probably do a, a Victoria-Austria game I think would be fun. I quite like Austria. Maybe somebody else, but you know. That's that. So let's take a look what other questions have popped up. Uh... Da -da -da -da. That's all some stuff. Dubied four five six. I'm glad you enjoy my intro music. That's that's why I put it there to be enjoyed. And let's see. Yeah, need to micromanage my cities better. Yes, yes, I do, Scaramanga. But I'm not. That's the problem. I'm not a min-max gamer, <laughs> so it probably makes my series pretty useless to watch. But hey, all right. So let's just take a look. Make sure I didn't miss any other questions on part one. Uh, Mr. Breakthrough X. Yeah, I mean, this is going way back when I said the Southern Front in World War One was not so important. 
so over in Italy and stuff. I, and the term not so important was absolutely, totally incorrect. Um, but it just, you know, it's... Um, it's something that I don't know enough about. <laughs> so I... When I when I study World War One, it's all Western Front stuff and a little bit of Eastern Front. Uh, I know the Italian, and I mean I know the fighting up and down the Po Valley there was atrocious, just like it was in World War Two. Uh, but I mean basically you had trench warfare in mountains, which just adds an absolutely other ridiculous layer to the fighting. So, and and I mean here's so here's the comment, right? It's interesting that the Italians weren't able to win with uh, two to one superiority. And again, uh, you know, World War One, it you needed massive superiority because of the styles that it was. It was grand battles, grand Napoleonic line them up and shoot. But you were doing that in dug in positions with machine guns and heavy artillery fire. And then with the Italian peninsula, you had putting that on a freaking mountainside. So, it's grueling and grudging fighting, um, but yeah, again, it's a it's a theater that I just don't know enough about, and that's sad. But you know, that's it's what it is. <laughs> all right, I think that just about covers all the questions. Um, and I'm thinking Victoria Two multiplayer Marchish, so. I should be able to get everything sorted out for that. Let me know if you want to play. And, uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So, um, thumbs up if you've enjoyed, as always. Thank you guys very much for watching. Uh, leave your comments, questions, thoughts, concerns, what have you below. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next time.